Aha, my Romans Bible scholars, good to have you. It is Thursday, June 4th. Um, I am sorry I didn't get to see you yesterday. That was the plan. I had everything prepped and ready to go. Um, however, due to some unforeseen circumstances, some tree limbs falling down onto my garage and, and filling my entire driveway and having to clear all that out, thanks a lot to Mitch McCoy and Curtis O'Dell and Ethan Smith and Lauren Smith for coming out and helping me um, get all that done. Uh, thanks a lot for Taylor's turf, or Taylor's way, I guess, and Timber's Fall, Timber Falls for coming out and and uh, helping me out there too and getting it all cleared out and cut up. And it was a long, long morning, a uh, long afternoon too. I uh, woke up to what the weather people call a microburst thunderstorm in which um, suddenly a large, powerful thunderstorm descended upon our town and um, tore up a lot of a lot of trees and foliage and um, so anyways all that to say that's my excuse for not getting together with you yesterday I think it's a pretty good excuse and uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm not raring to go this morning um, and I need to be raring to go this morning because we're approaching a very culturally insensitive text today um, it is um, not a popular opinion, and it's not an easy thing to walk through, particularly if there are young people, um, young teenagers or, or junior hires watching this. I want to be very careful with how we approach this. Um, so I'm going to be very careful with how I approach this. We are going to not go into great detail. Um, we will approach this from both a, um, a viewpoint that glorifies marriage and we will then approach it from a more negative um, side to ensure that we get what Paul is hinting at here just a bit. Um, there's a reason why Paul doesn't fill in all the gaps. Um, there's a reason why God doesn't fill in all the gaps here, because um, there is some dis discretion um, that he approaches this text with. And so we want to use that same sort of discretion as well as we're teaching the text. But we understand to some degree what he's talking about. Um, and so we will approach it in that way. Um, so I'm going to come at it from a, from a positive spin, looking at the the glories of marriage between a man and a woman from a positive viewpoint. And then we'll look at the negative side of it with care and grace, um, showing why um, what Paul is talking about um, directly defies God's created order. So that's what is on the, the docket this morning. Some heavy teaching this uh, on a Thursday on June 4th for us. Um, and it's okay that only maybe six or 10 people are watching these videos. I'm not gonna stop um, because right now there might only be six people watching, but um, there are those who are catching up um, and aren't, um, are not watching them weekly, but they're watching them as they have time. And so uh, I'm going to trust the Lord that this will be profitable in the future as well. Um, this will be profitable to those who watch. So let's pray and we will get into our text this morning. Lord, we count on you. We uh, run to you this morning asking for your grace and your strength and your favor to carry us through this. Um, this text inspired by yourself. Lord, we know that it's it comes from your very mouth that you um, have intended for your people to know this and understand it and abide by it. And so we will. Uh, we will not shy away from the truth. 
We will not be uh, afraid of what the world might say or the consequences that might come. Um, instead, Lord, we know that you are our master and that you hold us accountable to your words and truth. Lord, judgment belongs to you. And so we want to, um, we want to disregard and um, disregard what could happen or the criticism we might get for not standing where the world stands. We want to love what you love, Lord, and we want to hate the sin that you hate. And so I pray that you would transform our minds this morning in that way. In your son's precious name, amen. Okay, Romans 1 verse 26 says this, For therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. That is our text this morning. And so we saw last week and a few weeks prior to that that rejecting God means a total upheaval of created order. Okay, It debases us when we reject God. It causes us to flip everything on its head and look at things backwards. It humiliates us. And this was Satan's goal from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. The shining climax of creation. Day six, man is created and woman is created out of the man's rib. Is humiliated by being under the rule of a snake. Okay, Adam had every right to banish Satan from Eden. But once Adam removed himself from the safety of God's word, from the safety of what is true and what is sure, he was immediately placed under Satan's rule. So the question I want to pose for you this morning is, we're going to, like I said, we're going to look at the positive aspect of marriage between man and woman, and then we're going to look at the negative aspect of marriage male, male, female, female relationship, okay? But the question I want to ask this morning is why marriage at all, okay? Why does marriage exist at all? Why do we live in marriages between a man and a woman? Why does anything exist? That's the, the big question. Why do you exist? Why do the, the sun and the earth and the moon exists? Why do animals and plants and oceans and mountains and atoms and galaxies exist? Well, the answer to all of those questions, including the one about marriage, is all of them exist to and for the glory of God, which means they exist to magnify the truth and worth and beauty, and greatness of God. Giving God glory is simply acknowledging who He is. Okay, When we talk about magnifying the character and person of God, we're not talking about taking a, a microscope to some microscopic element and showing everyone what this is. It's not what we're talking about here. God's, God's majesty and His grandeur fill the earth, fill the universe. And so we don't need to magnify it like a microscope magnifies God, God's glory. We simply need to acknowledge what it is and what, and what already surrounds us in its in enormity. That's what it means to give glory to God, to give weight to who he is. It says in Psalm 145, 3, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Unsearchable, it says in, in Psalms 145.3. That means the moment you begin inspecting his greatness, it leads you to more greatness to inspect, which leads you to more greatness to expect, to uh, inspect, which leads you more greatness to inspect, and you will never get to the end 
of his greatness. It just continues on and on and on. Everything that exists is meant to magnify that reality of his greatness. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43, 6 and 7, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. So God's saying here that I want to bring those people, the, the Jewish people that I created to glorify me, I want to bring them back to Jerusalem because I created them for my glory. I want them to glorify me in the place that they belong. So I'll bring them back. And it's the same that's true about the church. God creates Christians. He saves people for his purpose and glory. So we've been created to display the glory of God. And Paul ends the first 11 chapters of this great letter in Romans with the exaltation of God as the source and the purpose and the end of everything that happens. It says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And he makes it even clearer in Colossians 1.16, where he says, By Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Why? All things were created through him and for him. John Piper, a theologian, says, says it this way, There are two levels at which the glory of God may shine forth from a Christian marriage. One is at the structural level. When both, when both spouses fulfill the roles God intended for them, the man as the leader, like Christ, and the wife as advocate and follower of that leadership, when those roles are lived out, the glory of God and his love and his wisdom in Christ is displayed to the world. But there is another deeper and more foundational level where the glory of God must shine if these roles are to be sustained as God designed them to. The power and impulse to carry through the self-denial and daily, monthly, yearly, dying, that will, that will be, uh, the, the daily, monthly, yearly dying that will be required in loving an imperfect wife and loving an imperfect husband, this must come from a hope-giving, self-sustaining, su superior satisfaction in God. Piper writes, I don't think that our love for our wives or theirs for us will glorify God until it flows from a heart that delights in God more than marriage. Marriage will be preserved for the glory of God and shaped for the glory of God when the glory of God is more precious to us than marriage. When we can say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. When we can say that about marriage, about our husband or our wife, then that marriage will be lived to the glory of God. Marriage is about the glory of God. That's what it is. And Jesus defines God's definition of marriage, the kind, of, the kind that glorifies him. Jesus himself explicitly states the kind of God-glorifying marriage. It says in Matthew 19, 3 through 9, And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read that he who created him from the beginning made them male and female? Verse 5, and, and then he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. When Jesus teaches here in this text, 
He was teaching a large crowd of Judeans, of disciples and religious leaders. There were all kinds of people there at that moment with presumably all kinds of beliefs and worldviews and understandings about marriage and sexuality amongst them. Yet, Jesus, even with the risk of offending these people, Jesus states very clearly, even at the risk of offending them, that marriage is between one man and one woman. And he quotes the creation account. He goes back to Genesis. He appeals to creation itself. This is the created order. This is another tool that God has given humanity to bring glory to himself. A man and a woman marriage. A man-woman marriage. Unity and diversity. And this is what what a man and a woman marriage provide us. Two creatures who are different biologically, yet come together with different strengths and different roles, determined to use those different strengths and those different roles to glorify God. So God the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is perfectly united amongst themselves. All three members contain the same perfections and can contain the same desires and the same wills. But they're diverse also. They're not only united, but they're also diverse in that they are three distinct persons. The Son executes the Father's plan. The Holy Spirit empowers the Son to carry out the Father's plan. The Father, of course, plans. This is the glory of marriage. A man and a woman, diverse in biology and diverse in role, come together in unity. And this is what points to their creator. Man doesn't get to decide what glorifies God. God decides what glorifies God. And Jesus explicitly tells us in Matthew 19, 3 through 9, that it is through man and woman in marriage. And so, is it any wonder at all that man, in turning to idols, in turning away from their creator, would become their own gods and completely overturn God's created order and create a completely different order of their own? Is it any wonder that man in his rebellion against God would seek to redefine marriage or alter it or throw it away altogether? And this brings us to our text this morning. We read in verse 26, this re For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So Paul speaks in these verses by way of clarifying what he said more generally in chapter 1, verse 24, about the akatharsia, or the sexual impurity. What is he talking about here? It says in verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. So what were the lusts of their hearts? How did they dishonor their body? Well, here's your answer. Women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. This is the second exchange that the unregenerate, unsaved person makes who rejects the revelation of God. They give up the glory of the immortal God for idols of creatures. 
And so God is justified in his wrath to give them up to even more confusion and even more foolishness. So the, the punishment for the conduct involved in idolatry was their being given over to dishonorable passions. Not honorable, dishonorable, not honorable passions. It's not something to be celebrated. It's not something to be honored or revered or lifted up. It is something to be mourned over. Paul uses a strong term here when he describes homosexual relationships. He says, it is adamia pathos, disgraceful, dishonorable passions. So it's pretty clear for us in this text, Paul's attitude towards this kind of behavior. He couldn't express it any more unfavorably. Okay, he's not painting this, he's not sugarcoating this at all. He's not being careful. He's not being politically correct. He is speaking God's heart towards these actions. It is dishonorable. It is disgraceful. All the Jews of that time, all the Jewish Christians of his day had these types of attitudes towards homosexuality as well. And if Paul wanted to stand up for those who had the homosexual lifestyle, if he wanted to support it at all, he should have done it here. But he doesn't. Along with the Jewish Christians of his days, along with the Jews of his day, he condemns it. The only natural sexual relationship the Bible sanctions is one between man and a woman within marriage. Do you hear that? It's not just man and woman, but it must be within the confines of marriage. All other, all other things that happen physically between a man and a woman that happens outside of marriage is unsanctioned by God. And all things that happen between a man and a man and a woman and a woman is unsanctioned by God. All homosexual relations constitute sexual perversion and are subject to God's judgment. So, man in their pursuit of freedom from God's truth, suppressing it, running away because they want to live their own lives. They don't want to think about judgment. They want, they want to be their own authority. Okay, In their pursuit of freedom, men turn to perversion and inversion of the created order. When man forsakes the author of nature, he inevitably forsakes the order of nature. Loud. And here's the thing. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe some tree stuff, probably. It's probably what it is. Tree stuff. It's very loud. Um, in both the Old and the New Testament, God's Word condemns homosexuality in the strongest terms. It is so serious in God's eyes. Under the Old Covenant, it was punishable by death. And under the new covenant, the cross of Christ offers forgiveness to those who choose this lifestyle and walk in this pattern of thinking. Homosexuality is so serious in God's eyes that Christ had to die himself in order to redeem those who live this way. All are born in sin, and every person has different tendencies and different temptations towards certain sins. But those who have a tendency or a particular temptation to steal, they have to recognize that stealing is bad, and they have to display their repentance by avoiding theft in every way possible for the glory of God. Those who are constantly tempted to drink 
and to get drunk should recognize that it is sin and display their repentance by avoiding the alcohol that makes them drunk for the glory of God. Christ's death was our death, and thus we are freed from these temptations and from these cravings. And this is the same with an unsanctioned homosexual lifestyle. Those who have a tendency towards this thought pattern and lifestyle, but want to please God and give glory to Him, must turn from it and run from it from the glory of God, for the glory of God. They must recognize it for what it is, sin, and cling to their Creator for freedom from it. It is a disordered passion. It is a result of the fall, and it's not something to celebrate. It says, men were committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So sexual perversion is a result. It's a sexual perversion is itself a penalty. Being a sinner is the punishment for sin because sin has consequences and sexual perversion is the penalty for being sexually perverted. So friends, we must have, believers, incredible compassion, incredible grace, incredible mercy to those who struggle in this area and experience this penalty for rejecting God and His Word. Like you and me, like the thief and the murderer, they desperately, desperately need the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, through 11, it says, And do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. 1 Timothy 1, 8-11, Paul says, We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mo mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So our response is to share the gospel with these folks. Love them uh, as our neighbors, but to speak the truth in love as well. It is not loving to celebrate the sin in someone else. It is not loving to, to call what God calls sin good. But we have to recognize as we're sharing the gospel with these folks who struggle with this particular issue, that there is nothing good in us. And all we have is Christ. So we have no ground for boasting in the fact that you've been chosen to love what God loves and hate the sin that God hates. Approach them humbly and graciously with a servant's heart, wanting what's best for them. Approach them with kindness. God's purpose, remember, God's purpose in giving them over to these passions and giving them over to these lusts God's purpose isn't to be mean to them. Just We said this a few weeks ago. 
But God's purpose is to show sin is exceedingly sinful so that their only hope is in Christ who died and rose again for them. Thank you, folks. I will see you next week, and uh, we'll talk again later.